Hello world and welcome back to practicing awakening from the meaning crisis. Uh, my name's Sarah and I'm here with my friend Lizelle and we are going through the awakening from the meaning crisis series by John Verveke. So today we're on episode three which he calls the continuous cosmos and modern world grammar. So I'm going to pass it over to Lizelle to get us going. Thank you, Sarah, and hello world. Um, yes, I wanted to start again with Plato, not a prayer this time, but um, Socrates himself is speaking here. And uh, I think it's a good spirit to, to meet in. Uh, to carry on an argument when you are yourself only a hesitating inquirer, which is my condition, is a dangerous and slippery thing. And the danger is not that I shall be laughed at, of which the fear would be childish, but that I shall miss the truth where I have most need to be sure of my footing and drag my friends after me in the fall. Now, Sarah, the pre previous recording, as soon as I started watching this third episode, I realized, oh my God, I got something wrong, which you got right. And then I corrected you, making you doubt yourself. And I sincerely want to apologize for that. And then I refer specifically to the uh, Neolithic period. I confused, I got the names confused, the Neolithic and the Upper Paleolithic period. Well, you were right. The Neolithic period is the time when agriculture started around 10,000 BC. And I was wrong because I thought it, we were referring to the Upper Paleolithic period, which was the one quite some time before that. So I just want to make my formal apology. And uh, yes, and... Uh, Next time when I uh, don't doubt yourself, like doubt yourself because mm -hmm. we need to doubt ourselves, but not in comparison to me, like do. Yeah. So apology that's accepted. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Yeah. I mean, with the similarities between the words, easy. And also we were tripping up over that word anyway. <laughs> so it's yeah. nice to revisit it again. <laughs> Exactly. I can now pronounce it. Do you remember the first time I couldn't yeah. pronounce it at all? And now I've made such a mess of it that now I can pronounce it. So, now it's stuck. <laughs> yeah. You err, uh, you learn. That's right. So, I think, yeah, that's a really good lesson yeah. from it too. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, well, that, I mean, takes us back where we've come from because in the first episode, we were just kind of describing what the meaning crisis is and some some items that go along with that, like shamanism. And then we started on this venture through history. And we were talking about Upper Paleolithic, Neolithic, all these kinds of um, psychotechnologies that are being developed during those times. And now we seem to have landed ourselves in some part of history where we're considering um, the collective cosmos, like a lot of big, uh, there's a lot of big concepts in this particular episode. And so I think what John tries to do is break it up into first describing this difference between myth and what he means by myth. And then we move through how mythology kind of worked in different areas, such as Israel, such as Greece. And then yeah. he, he goes briefly into India. Um, I think there's going to be even more of that in the next episode, but I had to stop. I had to, yeah. th he's getting really good uh, at the cliffhangers because you can tell there's this moment in any series that you're watching where you're like, okay, now I'm hooked. <laughs> and I've hit it with the third episode. I think that was where I was like, no, I can't move on to the next episode because then I'm going to start blurring the lines of what's episode four and what's episode three. So I did stop myself. Um, so yeah, there was three books that there is listed being mentioned in this particular episode. And I'm not sure if you have a copy of all of those but one is by Jung, one is Nietzsche, and then the other one's Paul Tillich, I believe. Um, first, back, I just want to back up a little bit because you, you started with us, um, th the historic quest that we're going through. And I just want to specify that the period we're in now is the axial age. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, so it's okay. still he, the previous episode he referred to this book. So it's still this book. And um, what's great about this book is every single chapter, it goes uh, like through time periods, but every single chapter, chapter has like specific parts of, of Israel, specific parts of India, specific parts of uh, um, Greece, and then specific parts of China. Every every chapter, so it's really. I, I thought it was a great book. Um, so just that, okay. And then, um, so we know we're in the axial age now. That's that's where we are. And uh, yes, referring to the books, I have uh, Jung's book in Dutch, mm. and so I have most of his books in Dutch. But uh, this is a really good um, man and his symbols, which is the one he recommends. Is a really good intro to Jung actually because it's not Jung himself um, some people say he's a bit difficult to read I'm obsessed with Jung Jung is the love of my life that's that's <laughs> for sure like I can spend like the rest of my life just reading him it's like wow that man but anyway so but this one is written one of the chapters by him himself and the rest is by um, some of his students slash disciples so it's about his thoughts, but it's an e easier way to process his thoughts. So I think maybe that's why John recommended that book specifically, um, because it's, I can't really remember that this is the best book to get an understanding of his myth way, view of mythology. This book, if you wanna get lost in his view of mythology, then this book is a really good book to read. It's the first book of Jung I read, and I literally, when I reached the end, I started all over again. <laughs> it's, it's just that uh, mesmerizing. So, um, yeah. And I do have Nietzsche as well. Uh, it's not really, the, the, the material that he covers doesn't really, is not really reflected in here. It's just, yeah, Nietzsche is a brilliant writer and a prophet. So it's always good to read. Uh, and then Telichai only have a digital copy, but okay. also lovely to read. Okay, so would you say that we could start with this idea of what myth is, kind of to go ahead and delineate that from what we, we commonly know as myth, which is a falsehood that is widely believed, but he's emphasizing that it's actually a different thing that he's talking about when he's describing myth. Do you want to say what what he? For me, it was so obvious because I, when I uh, uh, it was one of the first things I learned when I started studying theology is when we talk of myth, this is actually what we mean. We don't mean a falsehood. So. Yeah, because he says um, myths aren't false stories about the ancient past. They are symbolic stories about perennial patterns that are always with us. And of course, I really like this description as an astrologer because it's exactly how I think about our participation with the cosmos is that things come back around um, and it's always cyclical in that way. Um, so it's he says it's not scientific nor just metaphorical. So it's not just that idea of metaphor, but it's something deeper it's something that is attached to our cycle as humans or at least we can understand it that way the myth this idea of myth i uh i don't really know how to go deeper into this um i wrote down one of these sentences i think he said it is mythologies mythologies have to be live livable but I think we live myths, whether we know it or not. That's so. The, it's not. The thing, yeah. Yeah. So it's not really about. Yeah. Well, yeah. I think that leads us right into the concept of real world versus everyday world, because in the everyday world, we're still living according to myth. It's just most people aren't aware of what myths they're, you know, living within. I'm just thinking about money first and foremost, this idea that money is actually 
you know, the source of value in money. So it's like, actually, the valuable part of money is that it's agreed upon that you, you get to hold this wealth, you know, based on how much of this you accumulate there, but there's no attachment to that money being actually valuable. So for in, in the case of an expensive meal, sometimes it's even less food that you're getting with an expensive meal, but there's this whole presentation and, you know, maybe it doesn't even taste that good, but there was, there's this price tag put on it. And so now it's this worth and really what it, what it actually boils down to is that the person that's spending money on this meal is probably finding less value in their money so their money is actually less valuable they can just spend it you know haphazardly it doesn't matter i don't have to you know of course they're probably keeping accounting and things like that but as far as an expense food isn't really that high up um whereas somebody that doesn't have any money or has little money and needs food, they're going to find great value in $5 getting them, you know, a burger or something like that. So there is just a case where the value is actually different for the money. Um, and so I'm getting to this idea of our money being a myth that we, you know, that we kind of believe in to live an everyday life. It's like, I need to go out into the world and make money in order to survive when actually you really just need shelter, food, and some water to survive. So. Money is complicated, I think. Yeah. So I hesitate to, uh, but I, I see where you, what you mean. I see what you mean. Uh, but yeah. I, when I say we, we live myths, I think more of uh, like uh, a lot of people make a lot about uh, Freud having absolutely lived the, I don't know how to pronounce it, the Oedipus complex. Oh, okay. Like, so he lived that myth. That's why it probably was to him, that was what all everything was about. Like um, uh, he had a really good bond with his mom. And even in the end, because the story of Oedipus goes on, like he and his daughter, something with an A, I can't remember now, travels, uh, like he's blinded and he travels. And Freud even did that. Like, so he, there was like all these weird little uh, similarities that popped up. That That's more what I was I see, was, okay. Was so actually the full storyline. Like, the... Quite a literal. Yeah. 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 Because it's narrative, right? Which is also complicated. Like, uh, uh, there's a lot of discussions on narrative as well going on. So, um, so in the case of Jung, it's kind of, or sorry, um, Freud, it's kind of like a self fulfilling prophecy. Yes. Uh huh. Yes. When you start that exploring that part of the mindscape, then you take on its likeness. <laughs> yes. Yes, I think that's what I mean. Like, if if you focus on a particular myth, consciously or unconsciously, you're going to start living Ooh. it. Hmm. Yep. Oh, I can definitely, <laughs> I can definitely confirm from my own experience that seems to be the case. So, interesting. Um, and I just wanted to add that this idea of the everyday mind, he kept saying, was the untrained mind. And so in that, um, I guess, mindscape, uh, there's a lot of illusion, violence, and chaos in this kind of everyday untrained mind, the everyday world untrained mind. And I don't know that he was saying this, but it seems like in the myth, the mythical mind, um, maybe there's an attachment to the natural cycles and therefore it's less chaotic because it's kind of going with the flow of the plot yeah i think maybe um we should because uh, the whole the whole series is about how in the axial age it changed from this continuous cosmos view where we were part of the cosmos and we were playing our part and it was all about power 
um, the word mana came to mind, um, but I don't know if that's relevant. <laughs> it's uh, an ancient word for power and um, how there's a limited amount of mana. That's what I was taught. A little bit, a limited amount of power in this cosmos. And we need to then perform rituals to get us as much of that as we can, but also keep in mind that other people also need that for their survival and the universe, everything needs that. So it's about keeping a balance. Um, and then how the actual age, um, they started to separate this world and the other world, the two worlds mythology. And um, I think what's important for the idea of mythology in understanding that is it's a way of seeing patterns. And that's, that's why when we call it the two worlds mythology, it was their way of seeing the patterns of reality. And they noticed that there are things in the natural world which are actually not the really real. So there must be a supernatural world where the really real is. And um, yeah, yeah, so. It's interesting because pre-axial, what I have for the notes is that the gods are tied to a particular function. So it's like you have a god of knitting or, you know, all the, the predetermined yeah, purposes, I guess, that the gods serve. There's no significant moral arc. Okay, so they're not thinking in terms of that cycle yet prior to axial. Axial revolution is when they get this mythology that they're um, part of a continuous cosmos, or did I get that wrong? No, quite the opposite way. Okay. So before the axial, axial um, revolution, humanity experienced itself as part of this world. And the gods were just like a higher version of themselves. That's why they could be someone in between, the pharaoh, which mm -hmm. is kind of and human and god. So um, because it was just different, uh, different, uh, some had more power than others. And the ones with the more power were the gods, the most power were the gods. And then the lesser ones were like divine, also kind of divine. So that was Egypt. So, because that's easy, because Egypt was the big empire before the actual age, before the, the collapse, which last time we talked about the collapse of the, the Bronze Age collapse. And Egypt was the big one. So then, because we know it, that, that the pharaohs were like considered gods. So it's then easy to remember it by, by that analogy or that uh, example. So, and then, yeah, the separation occurred at the, at the actual age. Okay, okay. that they were like no we're not actually part of th this what we see around us is not what it's really about this is there's something that we're strangers actually mm -hmm. in this world we don't belong here our true selves belong somewhere else our souls belongs on a higher plane uh, and things like that which we reject it uh, which is good but the problem is, which, which John then emphasizes, there was so many awesome things that grew from the religions of the Axial Age that we want to keep those things. Yeah. So how do we keep those things without keeping this two worlds mythology? Because we don't want the two worlds mythology. Because the two worlds mythology tells us like, uh, it's the two worlds mythology that gave us this disrespect for nature. Mm -hmm. Because... Um, this is just like, you know, an illusion anyway, Maya, it's, yeah. it's not real, so we can do with it what we want to. Uh, but yeah, so we don't want the, that, but we want the self transcendence that was inspired because remember, we talked about the actual um, religions that were like the, the, the focus was on like, you actually have responsibility for what happens to you. Um, so that's a good thing, <laughs> which we want to keep. And this, this, this desire to, to better ourselves, to, um, yeah, 
I uh, I actually was thinking of the whole whole thing that we as we, we we ladies spoke about. Like, why can't that be enough? Why do we have to self transcend? Why can't we just strive for greater wholeness? Because uh, uh, that seems to me, at least, a good way to get out of the whole uh, need for two worlds. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I wrote down that same quote of how do we salvage the ability to cultivate wisdom when we can no longer use the mythology that it was born in. So, so yeah, that separation of that self-transcendent world from, I guess, this physical world that we can name things in. I'm, I think I'm blurring here this this um, combination of Buddhism and cognitive science. And then I'm coming from a biology um, perspective. My perspective is built around these principles of biology. And so I see a, a world in which we name things. And that world was something I could understand, even evolution, the, the process of evolution, how all of this happens. There's, there's ways in which it can make sense. It's not, um, you know, well, it is fact. <laughs> it's hard because it's like, those are names that were given to it by us, you know, the different species of different things. But the reason that I'm so interested in philosophy is because there is that part of this real world that's philosophical, that's, um, that is not physical. It's not, um, tangible so that's interesting that was interesting to me that john said that the scientific worldview is returning us to the continuous cosmos it is the reason that we have that kind of perspective of well none of this matters um it's no longer something like i think that there's this perspective that morality doesn't really matter um, because the biology is gonna, just going to continue. And if I'm like an individual being, then what I'm seeking is pleasure. And so maybe pleasure takes precedence over everything else because it doesn't matter. I'm just going to die anyway. You know, I'm going to live out this life. And if I can just, you know, live as long as possible, for instance, that's something that science seems to want to do is extend our lives and make it to where we live longer. And Which was a pre-axial age thing, like live long and prosper, you know, yeah, like that thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it's not like that. I can tell you with grandparents that are 82 that, you know, are recovering from a cold right now and also take an ass load of pills every day to just keep themselves going. It's not, um, that's not it. The, the biology, continuing the biology, extending the biological life is not that promised land you know no yeah well said well said so we we moved through the axial revolution to really describe the idea of self-transcendence right that's kind of one of those things in the axial revolution that they're coming to terms with i guess is that they can transcend the self the physical realm and and did you well, have... if there's like a lower level and a higher level, then you want to move from the lower level to the higher level. And that is then their self-transcendence. And the problem now is we don't believe anymore that there's a lower level and a higher level. But we still want that self-transcendence. But what do we mean? It makes sense what they mean in their words. But what do we mean when we say that? Hmm. yeah because we have this pesky science in the way <laughs> <laughs> which we both love <laughs> which is, and that's the dilemma it's um i don't know there just seems to be a different um a way that science could work with mythology because I you know as somebody that 
looks into the celestial rotations and things like that and relates them to my my physical life when john says what we can't live in this mythos anymore i'm like but why (laughs) (laughs) i can (laughs) i'm okay with that yeah i think i have this this understanding for myself that it's bringing play back into my life to participate and allow this co-creation to exist within me so taking those stories and um, using them for my own purposes or taking on the likeness of a deity um, even though it doesn't logically make sense why that would do anything for me it's it's allowing pathways to continue to exist and so just in happiness, just in joy, just in any kind of play that we do, you can raise your vibration. And there's really no better way for me to describe what it is that's happening there. But if you listen to music, you are happy, you know, and then so you're feeling different feelings. There's different hormones being released in your body. So somehow in that act of saying, you know, I'm going to play pretend my niece will do this a lot, she'll say, let's play pretend that this is happening and it makes it real like now okay action you know the the play has begun and so now we're in this world where she's taking me to a shopping mall with the barbies or whatever (laughs) so there but there even you know my sister and i were talking the other night and it kind of sounded like our voices kind of get got really serious and so the kids were like peeking behind the corner and they were like playing They wanted to inject whatever conversation that was so serious that we were having with a little bit of fun. They wanted, you know, to, to bring that back into the discussion. And, and my sister said, that's what they were doing. They, they recognized that our voices sounded really stern. And so we needed some play, you know, in the, in the moment. So I'm not really sure where I was going with that, but I know exactly okay. where you were going. That basically what you were describing here was how to live in the continuous cosmos, because mm-hmm. you said like, yeah, it's it's not real when I take on the the role when I take on the um the, uh, do the clothing and uh, take on the role of the of the goddess. Like, what what am I actually doing? But in the continuous cosmos, you actually because she's full of power. So what you're doing is you're taking on some of her power and hence enhancing yourself or growing more powerful than that. So when bef- before you started speaking, I was thinking like, I do think both of us kind of intuitively have a way of living in both, both of these, the continuous cosmos and the two world mythology. But for the life of me, I don't know how to explain it in words. I, I felt, I'm feeling that same sense of struggle of like we've we've gone through history together with the past two episodes, and that was much simpler to describe. Yes. But because this is so intuitively natural for us to just exist in the yeah. two worlds, both, yeah, it doesn't seem that impossible. It's almost just like, come on, guys, we got the answer. <laughs> All we got to do is play pretend sometimes. <laughs> Which is actually one of the one of the answers that John would also give. The imaginal. They, he calls it the imaginal to play pretend sometimes. And uh, it's one of, spoiler alert, one of the prophets of the, uh, of the meaning crisis, which John refers to at the end, is like I told you last time and we refer to him briefly, I don't know how to pronounce his name correctly. He's French, Henry Corbin, uh, Corbin, Corbin. It gets uh, tough with all the R's and and (laughs) French. When you see it, it's very simple, but I, every time I hear it, I hear it differently. Mm -hmm. So now I'm just very confused. So, (laughs) but, but, (laughs) but yeah, so it is actually one of the answers, the imaginal that will come uh, eventually. So. So scientific. Oh <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that just it seems like that would be a tough one to uh to convince people to to join in on. I, I mean I, I still have this struggle with like spoil sports and people that just are 
cynical because I've been that person. I've been that person. I was like, why are they having so much fun doing that? And it's like, because, just because. It, yeah. what, are, what, what option do you have? And maybe it doesn't solve any problems, but it makes the moment more comfortable to play, right? I hesitate even to accept the fact that you say it doesn't solve any problems mm. because you are transformed by your participation in this divinity. And being transformed yeah. does, well, solve problems might not be the right word, but it's, it changes things. It changes things. That's interesting because I've been meditating over that image that from the first episode where it's rock climbing and you're forming your hand to a wall and where does it you know what's the next move and I noticed that in my life a lot I mean you and I were talking about over near the eclipse how things just kind of start to naturally fall synchronistically into place and it's almost like walls are shifting and then the maze has changed a little now and so yeah things do change when you access certain parts of your imagination, you do actually change your your outer world with it. You change your way of being and there's a ripple effect, I imagine. Yeah, that's something we were talking about before we started our recording too, mm -hmm. was like the butterfly effect and how anything that we do, even this conversation that we've now kind of decided is something that we're doing for our own sake, maybe <laughs> even more so than inviting anybody <laughs> into the conversation. Just like kind of, you know, that whole second order, like being able to observe our thoughts after the fact, this is something that we can revisit and see where our mind was in a certain um, point. So yeah, that's been that, like, that's actually starting to be very beneficial for us to just review this tape. And you yeah. err, you learn. Right. Yeah. Learning from trial and error. And yeah. well, when we do this, maybe nobody listens to it. And maybe it's just us reconnecting certain places in our own mind, you know, or connecting with certain parts of your mind and my mind together and and through your mind I'm connecting with parts of John's mind and through John's mind we're connecting with parts of you know ancient philosophical a shitload of people's oh, minds a shitload of people John's mind. if we can believe that there are eight degrees <laughs> to Kevin Bacon whatever you know, <laughs> then then certainly there's some kind of cosmic effect that we're having by just having the conversation opening up this pathway for somebody else to glean some sort of message for themselves because I know a lot of people and I used to be one of those people that just listens to podcasts in the background there's just a conversation happening in the background and some subconsciously it's programming me to pick up on different things this even happened it's happened for me quite a few times actually um Joe Rogan was one of the first podcasts that I listened to. I found Jordan Peterson through him. I found probably John Verveke through him. Just, just in you know the process of being a, a avid podcast listener, yeah. and that came from being somebody that listened to the news a lot. So the news cycle began as my internal um, dialogue. Then it was podcasters, people that are tripping on DMT and going all kinds of places, and then it becomes very. Um, targeted podcasts like Brett and Heather talking about the um, pandemic response and you know people responding to crisis in that way and even with Clubhouse when Clubhouse came out there was a collective mind hive around solving problems that was so ecstatic and sporadic and inventive and just like little bees buzzing around each other and just having conversations it was crazy and I needed to be in the moment the very moment that things were being discussed, I really, I was, I felt like I was observing the Avengers or something, having like a conference and I would just got to be there because there was a lot of, you know, I mean, Lex Friedman's in there just having a discussion randomly and you get to be a part of it. So there was a lot of discussions happening. And now what I'm doing is, okay, now I'm going to participate in that and see what that opens up. Not just, I mean, particularly for me, but maybe for everybody. Ooh, I like this word. <laughs> Can you read it? I don't know. Oh, is, is it the 
Yeah, is it the right way around? It is. Or yeah, is I don't know if it's oh, showing cool. the mirror on your side, but it's, oh, it's yeah. written correctly here. Cool. Yes, I just, just know having a, a to... few Greek letters, and and it just so happens. Well, that this I is know... easy. It looks, yeah, it looks like. Except that P. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah. that that came to mind because you said you had to be there. That like things were buzzing, things were happening, things were. We are most definitely living through a Kairos, and I think that's what you picked up in the hive. That like need also then to be part of that uh -huh. like so this this kairos is very interesting like i said we are definitely living in a kairos and i heard john say that and uh especially i think in his conversation with jordan hall i'm not sure but i think i heard it there and it kind of confused me because and when we get to the uh to the psychotechnologies in uh, israel we will focus more on how it was originally meant and that was the way I was trained. Like I'm a Calvinistic, uh, uh, I was a Calvinistic uh, Christian and I was trained in Kairos is about, well, eventually it's about the Christ, but um, the setting, the backdrop of the Kairos is that history is the unfolding of God's will and everything then happens according to, to that grand narrative where there will be a highlight and that is God's plan. And I know John doesn't um, subscribe to that. So I, I had the opportunity to ask him once, like, uh, I don't understand how you can be so enthusiastic about the fact that we are in a Kairos, but you don't subscribe to the grand narrative idea of history. And uh, he, he explained it by, um, what is it? Um, systems theory, a uh, dynamic systems theory, and later in uh, this the, the series we will get to that. And so when he when he said dynamic system, system theory, I was like, ah, oh, okay, yeah, because I remembered, I remembered the pictures that he was drawing on the board. It's uh, basically like, okay, so here's, can you see here? Yeah. So here's like a grain of sand, right? And then there keeps grain of sand falling, so it keeps growing, 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 and at a certain point it's too high, it can't hold each other anymore. So what happens, it, it falls. And then it starts growing with a bigger base. So it starts growing in a different way. Um, that's basically, so it, it, the system dynamically changes itself, basically, because of the continuous change. And then the moment where it collapses, that's like really important. That's the Kairos, where the collapse happens. So um, that's how he understands the Kairos in, in that context. I think when we get to it, when he explains it, he will probably explain it like a whole lot better than I do. <laughs> and then we'll ex understand it better. But the important thing is like when I, when I got it, I was like, I guess I was very enthusiastic to prove to him like, okay, yeah, I understand. So I was like, yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's cool. I get it now. And he was like, no, no, there's, <laughs> there's, um, there's an important part that I want to say. So let me say another thing. And then he told me, and because he also has a preacher side towards him. It's not only Jordan, Peter, uh, Jordan Peterson that has a preacher side. Um, he said, the important thing about a Kairos is like every grain of sand can be the grain of sand that makes the heap re-transform itself, reform itself. So you might be that grain of sand. I might be that grain of sand. And that is why, especially in a Kairos, our actions matter. It really matters. So I thought that was beautiful. And I just yeah. wanted to share that. It reminds me of Jenga now. <laughs> the Jenga. game where oh, you yeah. stack and then you got to yeah. pull one out and it's going to be, there could be just one that makes the whole thing tumble over. Yeah. But the, the, the beautiful thing of the, this dynamic um, system theory is that it doesn't just fall over, it starts growing again. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> so that's important. You don't want just something to collapse. Like, like we said last time, we don't want the Bronze Age collapse again. Mm -hmm. We want it to start growing again. So. Yeah, yeah. It, it's reminding me a lot of biology, um, just in that when something, when an adaptation maybe fails, 
well, you get kind of, you can get a bottleneck effect where now all species have to uh, pull from this same small genetic pool. There's not as much variability. You need a, you need a gene pool that has a lot of different genes in it to pick from as opposed to something that's very specialized, something that's, yeah, um, for a particular purpose. Um, and what we know about evolution is that it's very uh, resourceful <laughs> and it can, you know, from a collapse from something going wrong. I mean, we were talking about this with the mammals when everything on the planet was destroyed, the mammals go underground and then they start yeah. to. Uh, when the big things were destroyed. Yeah. There was yeah, room for so the little things. Yeah. The little things thrive yeah. in an environment that's kind of abundant for them because yeah. now there's all this, this stuff that's not getting eaten that they can eat. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay, so our, our Kairos discussion here, we wanted that to lead us into that um, Israel Hebrew kind of um, where biblical grammar comes from, like what, what, how, how that um, realm of thinking led us to thinking how we do now. I, I was, yeah. that was the impression that I got from where we're going with that. Yeah. Yeah, two things are important, like first, the, the way they wrote. No, that is important when we get to the Greeks. Okay, slash, scratch that. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> no um, thinking in a narrative is important. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because there was that idea of, I yeah, guess, being the, the, wrong, the circle. The, yeah. There we go. And okay, so whoops. that's us as a continuous cosmos, but, but what the Israel, the Hebrew kind of um, mindscape led us to realize is that we have a plot line and it and it could be like based on progress I, from what I understood this is like the deity of progress the Israel God <laughs> well it was actually the deity of war <laughs> yeah, but, <laughs> but, but yes well. it's like <laughs> he was he was the God with whom we could unite so that there could be progress it's basically the story that that I just referred to with John, like we discovered at that point our actions matter. Yeah, because we could be that grain of sand. Yes. That has that butterfly effect. That like the other mm -hmm. things are affected by our narrative. I, I love the words ongoing creation and God of the open future. That yeah, really God jumped out of me. Future. That really jumped out of me. Oh, and another thing he said, like, you know, at some level that your life doesn't unfold like a movie. Yeah. One of my favorite movies, which is like, don't tell John because it's the ultimate romantic comedy, <laughs> is, um, has a quote in the movie. Life's not like it is in the movies, right? So from day one, everyone ex ex uh, conspires to tell you that it is, but it's a, it's an awesome movie, but it's super romantic and super based on destiny and, you know, bumping into a guy and then he's the one type of thing, which John really frowns at. <laughs> like, yeah. Well, I'm thinking of one of my favorite movies, which is Stranger Than Fiction with um, Maggie Gyllenhaal and... Um, Will Ferrell and Will Ferrell, his whole life is being narrated, but it's inside his head. <laughs> oh, cool! <laughs> it's a great, it's a great movie too. Um, but a similar kind of rom com where he's her IRS agent and he's uh going through her um paperwork. She doesn't like him. Uh, anyway, it's a great, it's a great one too. <laughs> but but similar in that um. I guess they're playing with that idea. They're joking about how life isn't narrated in that way. It's not. Um, yes, it's the yeah, same I, idea indeed. Yeah, like life is not like it is in the movies. Yeah. And yet. But we can make it that way. <laughs> yeah. At least for certain periods. Yeah. At least for certain periods. Yeah. I mean, well, that's kind of one of the things that you recognize when you do live cyclically, when you do recognize the cycles of nature is that there's a time to kind of jump into action. And then there's also a time to wait 
you know, there has to be that climax build. It can't just be climax, climax, climax. And I think, you know, that's the way that we kind of live is that we need that excitement every moment. It's always got to come to this crescendo point. And then, you know, new things will come about from that. Um, I wonder if that, yeah, I wonder if that is one of the, because he says, like, we have no idea how strongly we're influenced by this new way of looking at the world. I wonder if that is what you just said, like, we need that. If that is because of what happened here. It's very possible. Like, we feel we, we need all these uh, highlights in our lives. Mm -hmm. Um because we have been exposed. So we've been drenched in this, this way of looking at history and hence at our own lives. I was thinking something very kind of similar um, with dreams and like how easy it is to visualize dreams that are far beyond what's possible, I guess you could say for me, versus like my grandparents looking at magazines back in the 40s, 50s the realm of possibility was just closed in a little more. And from that, like their experience just seemed to be a lot different. I don't know how, I mean, they're completely fine with stagnation in between events happening in life. They still remember life in this eventful kind of way where there's certain things that they talk about all the time. There's certain stories that they'll reiterate and those are kind of time stamps for them. And for my life, yeah, I mean, I grew up in an era where you have every movie, you've got every show, and there's, I mean, it's kind of like porn in that we're just so drenched in this idea of that progress, you know, mm -hmm. things will get better, things are going to be better, you know, or there, yeah. there's... I've even thought about myself in this way to kind of help me psychologically that this is kind of the part of the movie, the movie montage where it's the music and things are happening really quickly in the movie, but I'm living in that part of the movie where not a lot's happening. And it's kind of, you know, during that movie montage, the person's either like working out really hard or they're, they're just trying to like make something happen when then you finally cut back to the movie and things are starting to pick up for them. So I'm living the part I of think, the movie that's off screen. <laughs> I think in, in a sense, it is um, a great way to think of life, like, because it, the progress is, uh, I, at a certain point, John asked, like, are you living up to your potential? And that is that, right? Are we progressing? And I mean, this explains why this dude is so popular, because that's basically what he keeps asking people. Are you living up to your potential? That's his whole message, like summed up, like he inspires people to live up to their potential. But then I was also thinking about when, before we started recording, we were talking about the philosophical life mm -hmm. and how that is not living from highlight to highlight, quite the opposite and how rewarding that is. Yeah, yesterday I was sitting out and I was going to start listening again to this episode, but I was actually reflecting with friends. We're going through what's called the gene keys and we're going through our Venus sequence together. And so we've just been, um, doing voice messages, voice memos to each other about the gene key and our contemplation over it. And I just found myself so fortunate to have the time to just sit and listen to my friend talk for 30 minutes. And then an additional 20 minutes when she realized she had talked for 30 minutes while I'm doing this, a goat comes through my fence. <laughs> it's my neighbor's goat. And so I had to chase this goat down for like an hour, but I had all the time to do it that's the philosophical life. It's like, I'm not rushed to get to work right now. So I can't help my neighbor track down where her goat got out of the fence. It just felt like a day, you know, like there was an event that happened and there was something to it. It made it special. I just had the image of you in Greece. <laughs> it sounds like such a Greek thing to chase a goat around. <laughs> I'm glad you had that image because I'd really love to go. So <laughs> <laughs> 
maybe one day we can go together that would be I'd fun. love to yeah um yes so yeah so, not so that bad. is where the kairos idea comes okay. from the, the highlight in the story yeah sorry what were you gonna say well because that's what that's exactly what we were going with with the israel um leg of this conversation which is um we know that life doesn't unfold like a movie but we still we love for that big turning point or the kairos like we just we thrive on that the way you just spoke about how exciting it was to be part of that hive that's yeah. that that's that uh Oh, another thing that I see that I wrote down, which we do have to talk about, because it's just awesome, is da'af. Yeah, Knowing... he's kept saying this. Okay, is this like a Hebrew word? Yes. Okay. I, 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 I looked it up. I don't know how to spell it in Hebrew, but I looked it up. Can you still see? No. Yeah. Oh, no. Uh, okay. The... Yeah. Okay. And what does this word mean? It's the knowing. Knowing um well I want to say knowing through participating. Uh but that's not knowing through becoming one, through making love. That's 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 the type of intimate knowledge. Sex so. as a metaphor for knowledge, because there's some scripture I think he was mentioning where um, the term knowing was used to describe participating in sex and knowing through that intimate connection. Yeah, when uh, when the Bible talks of uh, they did it, they say he <laughs> knew his wife. <laughs> he knew her. <laughs> he knew her. <laughs> So be careful next time you say, oh, yes, I know that person. <laughs> right. And this is like, I mean, that's the exact point. It's like these biblical, this biblical grammar has such an effect on the way we speak now, but we don't even realize the. But, but does it though? Saying. I feel like this, this could have like a greater effect on us. Imagine living as if knowledge is something that you erotically participate in. I think I actually do. I do. Um, too. But <laughs> we do. <laughs> it's oh imagine everyone lived like that. Oh, it would be such a awesome world to live in. Mm -hmm. Like uh, but but it's it it kind of gives words then to what we're experiencing, right? This erotic attraction to knowledge, to really knowing and that that yeah that intimate love of knowing and yeah so this was cool i thought this was cool and then he also talked about the idea of faith he briefly mentions that yeah um he often refers to um like faith isn't what it used to be originally um like um we think of faith we think of propositions like i have faith that jesus is the risen christ something a statement mm -hmm. but originally it meant more like uh, giving your heart to like um i i am i am uh, calvin had this um image of a, a heart that was on fire and and that 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 effect that is faith and then i had to think of uh John uses the explanation of faithfulness, but I don't think faithfulness doesn't quite get it because it's like you know, you you have faithfulness. It's it's not quite the same as having faith, but the meaning behind the original is faithfulness. I I think it's deeper than that. I think devotion is is a better word for what it uses. Like I am devoted to, and I'm not a Christian, but I'm going to say it anyway. I am devoted to Christ as the risen Savior. Like th that's different from saying I believe Christ is the diff is the risen Savior in our way of understanding. Right. But originally it meant the same thing. And then um, I have to mention this book when I talk of devotion. Um, firstly, because 
everybody needs to mention this book every now and then. <laughs> it's <laughs> an amazing book. Of all the books that I've that John has recommended, this is the one that I would most e eagerly re-recommend to anyone. It's really a great book. John says it's the best book on Spinoza, and I imagine he's read a few because Spinoza is his favorite. It's one of the best books I've ever written. Like stop not not only on i also have her book of kigegard on my on my shelf i haven't read that yet i'm not quite there yet but i will i will it's and a, you were, you were mentioning that this um, book this one came out after the awakening series yes yes although john doesn't speak of spinoza that much in the series but it, it was published i think that my copy is from 2021 and I never get the hard copy, but I was so eager that I got the hard copy. And usually they come like first, the hard copies. So um, Claire makes a lot uh, of, um, of devotion. She has the entire first chapter is called Philosophy and Devotion. And uh, I, I just want to read like a paragraph, like mm -hmm. devotion need not be an expression of blind faith. It can be animated by desire blending with cognition. In the first place, recognition of a deep, lasting value and importance that is non-negotiable, irreplaceable, perhaps even unconditional. When we are devoted to something, we give ourselves, our time, our attention, our resources to it freely, though also with the feeling that this is something we must attain to. Devotion apprehends its object as necessity, necessary, not logically necessary, nor causally necessary, but spiritually necessary. It's just, this is a great book. It's a really, really good book. And so um, I, I, I try to work more with the concept of devotion. I, I see myself as at, the, at this stage of my life for at least two more years as devoted to the work mm -hmm. of John Favelki and Christopher Mastro Pietro. Yeah, I, I agree. There's a sense of, participating that comes with devotion as opposed to faith faith feels yeah. a little less attached a little less participatory like i can have faith and like you're saying like i don't think that this was how it was originally intended but just the way since we've separated so much from the natural world now faith is kind of this idea of blind faith i'll take a you know um trust fall like there's there's less um of me having power like me being able to co-create or participate yeah. or be a part of this process it's like when i take on the devotional practices that i have then i'm much more intimately um, um attached to the relationship that i have with whatever it is that i'm devoting myself to because i'm for the most part um allocating time to whatever it is that i'm devoting something to or my time to and so because of that, it's actually um, important to me, or I guess, yeah, it's important to me. And so I devote time to it. That's what holds value for me in my life is my time, as opposed to any money, any, you know, anything that I could own. I'm much more um, in a relationship with where I put my time, or I'm much more concerned w in relationship with where I put my time. And attention. Yeah. I don't think we always appreciate how expensive attention is. Yeah. And uh, so, and that then leads to this. A devotional way of knowing is a da'af way of knowing. The, well, and we, I mean, when we talk about, um, well, for me, I do meditation. And so meditation is that devotion to kind of making, um, different pathways connect connecting like allowing different pathways to connect by sim simply sitting and observing my own senses R definitely my breath definitely watching my breath and appreciating breath and also kind of allowing myself to recognize where sound's happening that's at the site of the eardrum so my brain is processing sound so um that's my devotion the time that i take to do meditation she actually the other thing that i quote but i i i can read the whole book so let's not do that <laughs> it's about um adapting new 
habits or more precisely practices and how that indeed is an, an act of devotion. So and yes. I do that because like, well, I'm trying to just like connect it all. So this whole idea of um, having a narrative, like I do see improvement in my life when I'm taking that time out to just clear it, you know, clear out my mind and, and honoring my body, feeling into my body, recognizing that I'm, you know, blood pulsing through veins and getting oxygenated by air that's being received. And so that they're in this plot of me as an existence, there seems to be benefit to me taking time out of my day, even if it doesn't feel in the moment like I, like anything's happening. There's just okay. something about this accumulation and in, in, in our like discussion of us having these discussions, even if it's in the moment, not feeling like something productive there is over time like over the course of time when i'm able to look back on my understanding of episode three now versus when i'm at episode 52 like my understanding of it is going to be progress like i'll have progressed and so that's kind of encapsulating this um, biblical grammar or this structure setup of story And I'm, I mean, I don't think he's implying that it's bad that we think that way. It's just not the whole truth. Yeah, right. But again, I was thinking, why can't it be and, and? Why does it have to be either or? Mm -hmm. Just because Kierkegaard wrote a book called Either Or, we don't have to go with either or. Like, I, I'm thinking of like a spiral. Can you see that? Yeah. It's like, and progress and a circle you know that's why can't it just be that it kind of makes me um it makes me reflect back on pythagoras because i told you that i i had gone down a pythagorean um rabbit hole and in since he does go on to mention greece i guess it's it's appropriate that we could potentially move to him but <laughs> yeah. what, what i found most interesting about pythagoras was um a well, look i didn't know a lot of the mythology around him or the stories about him and um i thought it was funny that he kind of formed a cult and um I and mean, i do think that he was probably trying to relate this logic that he had come to find so much meaning and relate this logic with like a way that humans could live and so it did actually turn out to be a little bit communist <laughs> is what I noticed and what, what was uh, brought up but um still yeah I I think that this um concept of abstract symbols and mathematic geometry with Pythagoras was one of the places that we were going with um yeah Greece yeah because we, we definitely wanted to cover also the comparison between Hebrew writing and Greek writing. Yeah, that's why I'm sitting here, actually. Well, well it was so handy sitting here in the end. Otherwise. Because yeah. wanna, I, wanted, <laughs> I wanted to illustrate, uh, like, the difference between the two languages. So first, I'm going to write it in Hebrew, the same word. So that is the Hebrew. Now I'm going to write it in our alphabet. Huh. Can you read it or not? Is it a little? I think, uh, well, without vowels, or does this have vowels? Yeah. Oh, j just what you read, you know, it's without vowels. Okay, so D, V, D? Yes. You're not really getting what I'm trying to write, right? DVD. So this is the Greek, and I'm going to write the easier way. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. Or in our can you re is it uh, <laughs> a little hard, David? <laughs> Yes. David. <laughs> yes. And you see how easy, how much easier that one is mm -hmm. than this one. Right. So yeah. that is the difference. 
and I was explaining that you hit this with Arabic too, where they've compensated for not having vowels by what looks like punctuation marks, but it's their vowels. They've added vowels yeah. in to make it easier to read because, well, what I know about Arabic is it's, it's a very logical language. It's logic based. So you remove a chunk and you put a chunk here and like there's logical, it's almost mathematical the way that the, and I think Hebrew is very similar in yeah. that there's missing pieces here so you could say dovad or david or there's yeah. lots of different sounds that can go in between there and they wouldn't write that in so in order yeah. to even read you'd have to know the words first yeah. to get and through the sentence. everything from context everything you had to derive from the context yeah so it was very very difficult they around six the sixth century to the 10th century they they added these uh, little dots and um marks like this and things like that they added yeah very similar to, for for to arabic for arabic cool mm -hmm. and this is why it's i mean 10 years after being first introduced to this language i still can't read as much because yeah. most texts aren't going to include the vowels people just know the words yeah. and they can just shoot right through it so oh that's difficult yeah 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 Okay, I'm just going to leave David there. David. David means beloved. <laughs> so it's appropriate. Yeah. Um, well, we're coming to the close here. Uh, we didn't spend too much time in Greece. I'm sure there will be more on that. Um, yeah. The just... next two is about Plato. and. Oh, yeah. Okay. So we're going to take yeah. a deep dive into Greece. Um, and... Yeah, we're going to dive into Greece. Nice. Well... <laughs> I think then maybe we could come to that last question of whether or not we experience the universe. So I'm going to I'm going to read yeah. the quote from John. Okay. He he ends with Do you actually experience the universe as a cosmos? And with cosmos then because this was by Pythagoras that termed it as that which is beautiful beautiful and ordered, the beautiful and ordered whole. So do you actually experience the universe as a beautiful and ordered whole? And we were laughing because yes, we do. <laughs> <laughs> so we're not a good I don't know. Uh, case study. No, I don't know if it's because we're women or because we're weird. I don't know, but well, yeah, both. <laughs> Why does it have or to be wonderful? Either? <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah. Well, and like coming from this perspective of astrology is what I have in biology and seeing life, I mean, the study of life and philosophy too, they're what, like I'm intimately connected with life and have always been. So I do, um, and even more so than I ever did before, once I started digging into philosophy, I start seeing this, um, this world that doesn't seem to be physical. I can't experience it through my senses and so even more so when i tap into that part of my existence the the fifth sense or the sixth sense or you know beyond my five senses then i start to you know commune with the cosmos and become rec recognizing that how i'm part of that whole mm, thank you for referring to the senses i i do also want to mention that your in the talk we had with the other ladies, you mentioned something about how you meditate on the connections of the, the cosmos, basically, but in your own words. And that was just beautiful. But I refer people to the other video to go and see that. But um, yes, we were talking about supernatural before we started recording and how supernatural the word actually encaptures this two worlds view, because it's you have a natural and then you have the supernatural and i have a huge problem with the word supernatural uh, because there is only one and so we were talking about but why not just suprasensual or circumsensual because we know that there are frequencies of light that we can't see there's frequencies of sound that we can't hear we know there are there's more to reality than what our senses can perceive and sinking into those sinking into that instead of striving to reach that 
up there. Maybe that is what we intuitively feel we're doing. And I don't know, maybe we're just bullshitting ourselves, but oh, man, <laughs> good. Always. It feels good to bullshit myself. That really... I, well, I don't want to actually go because I was thinking after the first episode, we were like, yeah, maybe I, I was like, oh, like, yeah, we maybe we're bullshitting you. But that's not really true because we do have a very high regard for truth. Right. And bullshitting implies that you don't have a regard for truth. And we do have, we wouldn't do this if we didn't. I, I think the ultimate thing I'm devoted to is truth. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm devoted to the work of John at the moment, because I feel that it can lead me to a better understanding of truth. So bullshit is mm, mm. <laughs> it's not quite the right word. Like, no, I, it no, could be I that agree. we're doing that, but it, definitely not on purpose. But who does? <laughs> well, yeah, that's true too. But the <laughs> but you were going with that um, concept of transcendence that came from the axial revolution. Like that's kind of what we pulled ourselves out of. Is well, they, they realized, hey, we can transcend this world, but then we're having this discussion of, but, but what's, what's transcending this world? Why not just incorporate, reincorporate yourself back into it without having to have that transcendent um, perspective, like having that above perspective? Um, Sink into the beauty of this world. Yeah. And expand your understanding of this world. That's a way to self transcend yourself right because just because things can be explained doesn't mean they're any less magical just because we can describe and name things that doesn't make it any and I think that does sometimes take the magic away when we're just like that's that process that's what that's called or that's that animal that's what that's called and we lose the magic of wonder and so if okay, you know, we don't necessarily have to lose the wonder. We focus on that a little more, focus on the it, patterns and how synchronistic things can be in that way. It might take the magic away, but it doesn't take the wonder away. Mm. How wonderful it is. Yeah. Nice. Well, I think that's a really good uh, bookmark or place to insert the bookmark until we return and now we can go and watch the next episode yes now i get to watch it <laughs> it's a rainy it's a rainy uh saturday here too so uh that, oh, that great. sounds like a really pleasant thing for me to do it's a sign of the blessing of the gods rain so mm. it's a good day too well we appreciate uh you joining us along for this wild ride of a conversation uh going over <laughs> our interaction and our connection with the cosmos so we'll be back in a couple of weeks to go over episode four and we hope that you'll join us thank you mm -hmm.